let me ask you something. Is there anything bigger than God? We've kind of been talking about that the last couple of weeks, right? There is nothing bigger than God. Then why is, why is depression, why does that get to be the thing? It's like, well, yes, but. So far, we've, been, we've talked about every, how everything we need, is, it's, it's in the can, right? The Wile E. Coyote car- cartoon, how him and, and uh, the, uh, the Roadrunner are trying to get in to here. They're starving to death, and all they need is what's in this can. That will save their lives. It's here, but it's just untapped. And that's kind of what our series has been about. And we talked about how there's nothing so dead that God can't bring it back to life. And we talked about the Valley of Dry Bones and how he brought that back to life, and Lazarus and how he brought him back to life. The demon-possessed boy, this kind of situation that was never going away, God cast the demon out of. And then last week, we talked about there's no situation so helpless that God can't intervene. And that the answer to this anxiety and this answer to panic attacks and this answer to all of that, to anxiety, is peace. And that we need more peace. What if there is more that we haven't tapped into? And we talked about how to get there. And if you missed that, make sure to go back online and find that because there's some really good uh, tips there. And what's interesting is I got home last Tuesday night. And as soon as I got home, I was on Facebook for a minute and I and I saw this post about this story about this megachurch pastor. You probably know him. I didn't know him until I read the story of Jared Wilson, who committed suicide. Either that day or the day before, I can't remember. Megachurch pastor. The guy who had, had a whole ministry developed around um, depression and, and how to overcome it. And he takes his own life. I don't look down on him. I don't look down on him. I heard for him like many of us probably do. And then the world looks at us and says, see, I told you. There's no hope in the church. There's no hope in Christ. Yes, pray for me. Send your good vibes. Do whatever you want to do. But really, if you really want to break depression, the answers aren't in church. The answers aren't in Jesus. The answer's in this and this and this. And we know that we... But we've, we've created this unbeatable bully, this unbeatable monster. And it's like, pay the bully. Pay the bully or he's going to get you. I remember, I don't have time to go into the whole story, but I wasn't much different. Six years ago, through a set of circumstances I don't got time to go into tonight, but I'll share with you one day, surely. I remember I had lost all hope. I'm a pastor, and I'd lost all hope. And I remember there was a chin-up bar. Carrie had gone out walking I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep my marriage. I didn't know what was going to happen with my kids. I didn't know what was going to happen with my job. I didn't know what was going to happen in life. I could not, in that moment, it was like there was no alternatives. The hope was gone. And I remember I was laying on that couch, sweating, just shaking. And I remember there was a chin-up bar. And I remember I was wearing a belt. And I knew I didn't want to do it in a way that would make a mess. But I knew if I did it this way, I could just slip away and the world would be a better place without me. When you lose your hope, there's no other answer. And I remember there was a few things that kept me from it that night, but I was that close. Ephesians 1.18 says this. How many of you guys still have your scripture? You have you wave it at me every time. Come on. You got a little piece of paper? It's Ephesians 1. Wave it at me. Come on. Come on, wave it at me like you. Yeah, there you go. Let's read this. This is what Paul says to the church of Ephesus. This is a guy who's locked in prison. He can't go anywhere, and he's in prison for not doing anything wrong, but just for preaching the gospel. And this is what they said to him. This is what he says to them. These people that are free, he's in prison. He says this, I pray that your eyes of your heart will be enlightened, lightened up, that would your eyes would be open so that you would know deeply what is the hope of your calling. What is the hope? What is the hope? He's saying, I hope your eyes, the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, will be opened up so that you can see what's the hope of your calling. What is the hope? Someone say hope. hope. See, so many people, when they wrestle with depression and suicide, they talk about hopelessness. There is no hope. And suicide happens whenever there is not one more option. The only option is what I can see right in front of me. There is no hope. There is no future. And so I give up. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be open so that you will see the hope 
Hope is such a powerful thing. In fact, there was a, an experiment that, it, that these um, scientists did with laboratory rats. They wanted to see how they would survive in different circumstances. And so they drop a, a rat into a bucket of water in the complete darkness. And what they found is that after three minutes, it stopped kicking and it died. What's interesting is they took another bucket and they let one ray of light, one ray of, ray of hope into it, and it lasted for 36 hours. One with no hope only lasted three minutes. One with hope, with light, lasts 36 hours. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is a weapon. My, the middle name of my, my daughter is Hope. In fact, her first name is Macy, which means one who wields a weapon. And her middle name is Hope. So I tell her every day, I say, Macy, you wield the weapon of hope. And everywhere she goes, whenever we brought her into different places, there was a, a funeral, a tragic Death had happened, and we brought Macy as a baby into that room, and different than any other baby I've ever seen, somehow hope came into the room. It's like she was owning her name. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is such a powerful thing that it said a person can live 40 days without food, or 40 days without food, four days without water, four minutes without air, but only four seconds without hope. Hope is a weapon. First John, or John 1, 4 says this, in him, in Jesus, is life, and life is the light of man. Jesus is the light that shines into the darkness, and it gives us the ray of hope that keeps us swimming when we don't feel like we can. He is the hope of our soul. We got to have hope. Well, tonight we come to the story of Elijah some 2,900 years ago. Now, last week we talked about Elisha. Elisha was his apprentice. Elijah was before this. This is 2,900 years ago, and he's one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament, and in the Bible even. And in the New Testament, when Jesus is about to go up and be hung on a cross, he goes up on this mountain with some of his boys, Peter, James, and John. They go up this mountain. They call it the Mount of Transfiguration because while they're there, all of a sudden they look up, and Jesus is there, and he's in his glorified, like, glowingness, right? And beside him is Moses on one side, one of the most important people in the Bible, and on the other side was Elijah. Elijah would be the one, the name of the prophet in whom we would name our son, Elijah James, after. Elijah being the prophet, James being the the apostle, and seeing the Old Testament and New Testament come together, hopefully, in this boy. One of the most powerful prophets. And so he's no lightweight. Someone say, he ain't a lightweight. He's a prophet to Israel in the time of 1 Kings 16. And he's guiding the people's spiritual lives. And the king is supposed to be guiding their natural lives and their governmental lives. And that's what it was supposed to be. It was like the prophet and the king. And they together would help all the people. The prophet would take care of the spiritual stuff. The king would take care of all the national stuff. And, and, and the, the, the Israelites, they're supposed to be the people of God. They're supposed to shine this light in the darkness, the darkness of all these tribes and pagan groups around them. And they would be the kingdom of light of God shining in the darkness But the kings got worse and worse over time, each one outdoing the other. And then we come to a king named Ahab. Someone say Ahab. Ahab. And he he was not a pirate. He was just a bad king. And it says in 1613, 1 Kings, he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Any of the kings before him, it's like every king would do a little bit worse, and Ahab did worse. And what did he do? Well, it talks about it, but I'm just going to break it down as quickly as I can to just kind of explain to you what is going on in this time period. He turned his back on God. He started worshiping idols. Idols is anything you place before God. But he was worshiping idols of Baal. Someone say Baal. Baal. Or in Texas, we call them Baal. (laughs) Baal worshipers. Those dang Baal worshipers. But it's actually pronounced Baal. And Baal worship included begging God for the harvest and the rain, please God, and and sexual worship and all kinds of stuff like that. They would sacrifice their children, and the way they would do it sometimes was in the arms of Moloch, this big iron uh, statue of Baal, and his arms would be out, and and to get God, the gods to send the rain, they would cut themselves, and if that didn't work, if there's still a drought, then they would take their babies, and they would lay them in the hands of Moloch where their fire would be inside, and it would burn the baby to death. Another way, they would take an iron bull, and they would open it up, and they would be beating drums so loud that you wouldn't hear them whenever they threw the kid in the bull and shut it, 
and they caught on fire, and they burned just by the, the, the heat of, and, and it, the drums would cover the screams, and the smoke from their bodies would, would go out the nostrils of this iron bull. This is the kind of gods that the Israelites were worshiping. And Astaroth, his, his wife, this god's wife, it was all about temple prostitution and heightened sexuality, the worship of nature over humans, like dogs' lives are more important than human life. It's all pagan, by the way. And the killing of innocent blood, which is killing of these babies. This is the kind of worship that was going on. And he married, Ahab married this lady named Jezebel. Someone say Jezebel. She's basically this pagan witch, <clears throat> a pagan witch, and she's taken over. And basically all the prophets have dwindled, and she's got 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. And they all sit around her table every night, and they do orgies and all kinds of crazy stuff, and they eat food, and it's just this reckless, sexual, crazy, panic-type sex. And what he, God says is that, he, that Ahab married this woman. God told him not to intermarry. He told the Israelites, don't you intermarry with all these groups outside of, of, of the Israelites, because it's going to only be fair if you marry this girl, and she'll be like, you know, She's worshiping Satan, and she's like, why can't we go to sat satanic church? And you're like, well, because I'm a Jew, and he's, I don't do that. And Well, that's not fair. And in the, in the name of, uh, of, of diversity, we'll say, well, I guess it is only fair. Put God on the side burner, and we'll go worship him on one week, and we'll worship Satan on the other. He married this woman, Jezebel. And this is what it says in Revelation about what's going to happen to the church. This, he, God uses her name. In the future, this is in the ancient past, but it's also in the future. And in Revelation 2, he says, church, this is your state. You tolerate. Everyone ever heard the word tolerance? That's interesting. I'm just going to move on past that. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Well, I don't want to be mean. I mean, I don't want to push her away. I mean, I... grace, right? Grace. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. And by her teaching, she misleads the servants, the Christians, and the preachers into what? Sexual immorality. That's interesting. And then in the New Testament, Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says, do not be yoked. Do not be joined. Do not be married to gather with unbelievers. Because what fellowship does light have with darkness? Now, let me ask you this. There's, something almost no, there's almost nothing more wrong, you know, than whenever something bad happens to you and your best friend doesn't want to take sides. Right? Anybody ever? I don't want to take sides, but uh, what if, ladies, you got raped, and your best friend, your very best friend, says, "Well, I don't want to judge anybody, so I'm just going to stay out of it." You're not friends. Why? Shouldn't you be forgiving, and shouldn't you be you know nice? Don't shouldn't you just be nice? That's right. See, the thing is, God, what happened? Okay, men, what if you got married and, and, and your wife came up to you and she's like, when you're getting ready to get married, you, you got down on one knee and you said, will you marry me? She says, yes, I'm going to marry you. I'd love to marry you. One thing, <clears throat> one, day a month, one day a year, I need to be able to sleep around with whoever I want to. Anybody, guys, any guy going to take that offer? Anybody going to take that offer? Oh, well, maybe. See, the Bible says that God is a jealous God and he is not going to share you. Why is it different for you getting married than, when, than it is for Jesus to say, I want you to be my bride and I want you to be faithful to me. Why is that any different? People are like, God should just be able to get ready. He should just be able to just eat my sin and just be cool with it. He gets me. He understands. Really? Did you ever ask him? Does he understand? You know that sin that you just keep doing over and over and over again? Does he really understand it? Or did you just kind of tell yourself that because really you want to see other ladies? Sorry. The worst thing that can happen is when something heinous happens to you and your best friend doesn't want to take sides. And here he's saying, you are joining yourself with this other God. You're either going to choose Baal or you're going to choose me. What's it going to be? <clears throat> Third thing, Ahab set up a huge temple and an altar to Baal in Samaria. God called Jerusalem the holy city, but Ahab's like, nah. 
this is going to be our holy city. And guess what? I'm going to go by the rules of Baal now. And he's more important than Jehovah. All gods are equal anyway, right? I mean, all, all the paths lead to the same top of the mountain. I choose Baal. You choose Jehovah. We all go to heaven. Everything is fine. That's not how it works. That's a lie in, from, straight from hell. There is no other name under heaven by which man is saved except through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There is no other religion. There is no other way. There's no path up the mountain. The Bible says we have a narrow path, and his name is Jesus, and that's the only way to heaven. And unless we put our faith in him, that's it. You're done. So the people of God are involved in this kind of worship. They're hypersexual. I mean, that's not us, right? And, and <clears throat> they put nature above human life. That's not us either, right? So that has nothing to do with us. And they kill their babies. That also doesn't have anything to do with us, does it? That is the culture that Elijah is born into, and he's been raised. His mom is like, you're going to be a prophet, son. You're going to do great things. You are special. And he's like, I'm special. Put me. Come on, coach. Put me in the game. Put me in the game. Put me in the game. And his day comes. He's like, I'm putting up with this stuff long enough. We're going to see something happen up in here. The people of God are involved in this kind of worship, and Elijah sees what's going on. He has something inside him saying, that's not right. And it's like fire shut up in his bones. He's like, I got to do something about it. God says, I want you to go have a showdown with Ahab. So he goes up to Capitol Hill. He's like, yo, Ahab, what's all this business? What's all this business? What are you doing? Ahab's like, well, we're just trying to be diverse. We've got to accept everybody. <laughs> and my wife, she's a, she's, a, she's, she's a prophetess. No, she's a witch. No, she's a prophetess. Be nice. You're a Christian. You're supposed to be nice. <laughs> Elijah says, screw that. Screw that. You get your 400 prophets of Baal, and you get your 400 prophets of Astaroth. You bring them up here, and I'll get with me and myself. And let's, let, let's, 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 let's make two different altars, right? And I'll put a sacrifice on mine. You can put a sacrifice on yours. We're going to call for whichever God is real to send fire, and whichever God does, he's the real OG. So they're like, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. We outnumber him anyway. So Elijah, verse 18, verse 21 says, Elijah went before the people. He says, how long? He looks around at the people that aren't the prophets. He's like, how long will you waver between two opinions? Are you with God or are you with Baal? Which one is it going to be? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if, if Baal is God, then you follow him. But the people said nothing. You know what's worse than the insults of your enemies? It's the silence of your friends. I could take the insults of my enemy. I'm like, I don't care. But the silence of my friends? God's like, oh, they're just going to let them rail on me all day in class. That's cool. Oh, you use my name in vain all the time, not say a word. Cool. I see where I stand with them. The people said nothing. Verse 22, then Elijah said to them, am I, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, and Baal has 450 prophets. I stand alone. He starts to look at the loneliness. They call upon the name of Baal from morning to noon, and no one responds, and they dance like crazy around the altar. Da, 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 da. Come on, Baal! Hey, uh, Baal! Baal, where are you? Elijah taunts him. He's like, hey, uh, maybe, you, maybe he's in the bathroom. <laughs> maybe he's texting on Insta or something. Uh, hey, maybe you should shout louder, prophets. Uh, maybe he'll listen in. I think he's pooping. So they're like, yeah, he's right. They shout louder, shout louder, shout louder. They start cutting themselves, and they're bleeding. One of them is starting to faint. Oh, my gosh, blood. Elijah builds his altar, and he's like, okay, enough with you guys. He digs a deep ditch around the altar. He has them pour water on it three times so that the water fills up the ditch. This guy's a lot of faith, right? Verse 37, he says, God, answer me, O Lord. So that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell, kaboom, and burned up the sacrifice and the wood and even the stones and the soil. It made like a nuclear bomb, boom, crater, and it licked up all the water in the trench. He takes all those guys. He's, he's a friend of God. He's like, no, we ain't playing this double thing. All those um, prophets of Baal are killed. And everything is made right. 
Elijah has lived his whole life to see this happen. His calling is being fulfilled. He can see how this is going to go now, man. Like Jezebel's going to be dethroned, and, and, and Ahab's going to become a good king for once, and revival's going to hit the land. We're going to sing, you know, no mountain, you won't lie. Oh, you can light up mountains. It's fine. And, and the credits are going to roll, and he's going to be walking into the sunset. Look at the hero, Elijah. But that's not how it goes. Ahab goes home and he tells Jezebel that Elijah has killed all her prophets. And she, with the authority of the king behind her, says, the same will be done to me if he's not dead this time tomorrow. Elijah, the man who just saw all this fire fall from heaven, killed all the prophets of Baal, everything is going great. What does he stand back up to her and say, yeah, you're going to die. Verse 19, verse 3, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. Well, that's weird. He just saw fire fall from heaven. And now he's running for his life. He runs and runs and runs. And he doesn't stop for days. He just keeps on running. Like Forrest Gump, he's just going. And he's not stopping. In verse 4, he came to a broom bush, bush. And he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. God, just kill me. I have had enough, Lord. He says, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. <clears throat> Elijah has reached his lowest point. He was weary from the nights and days of just running. Because when you can't face depression, you just run from it, right? The sun's beating down on him, and he's starving, and he's alone, and he's isolated, and he can't run anymore. And this wide open white desert has crushed his soul, and he prays to die. He says, I'm no better than my fathers. I'm no better than the prophets before. I thought... I was going to be better than them. I was hoping that the people would see like, when God came down and then everybody would change, but nobody changed. I was hoping that I would be the one to bring revival and everybody like, man, that Elijah, what a guy. I was hoping that when my mom said, you're special, that I was going to be the one that would do what other prophets couldn't do, but I'm no better than my fathers. What it seems is that we're not going somewhere, but rather we're going nowhere. And there's no hope, and it's no use, and no matter what I do, and no matter what I try, it, in the end, it really doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't do any good. We're just going around in circles, and there's no meaning to life, and I wish I could just die. I have lost my meaning, and in fact, maybe the world would be better off without me, not much different than I was six years ago. See, the showdown on Mount Carmel, which is so interesting, the showdown of Mount Carmel is he's on this spiritual high, and it's not a day later that he's at his lowest of lows. I don't know if you've ever been there before. The spiritual high of two posts or someplace camp, and then all of a sudden you find yourself home after camp on Friday, and you are at the lowest place you've ever been doing things you never thought you would do, or back on your dorm just being delivered, and back in the dorm, you're back in the old stuff that you used to be into, and you're like, what's going on? And all the hope just seems to deflate. Right there on the hills of his greatest high comes his greatest low. Threats were nothing new to, to Elijah. He was used to the threats. He was, it was no big deal. He saw God move all the time. But this depression was fueled by disappointment. And I was looking at the word disappointment this morning. I thought it was kind of interesting. Disappointment. It's like dis, not, appointment. It's like the appointment didn't happen. It's like I was expecting an appointment with somebody or with God, but somehow that appointment dissed. Didn't happen. God fell through. Someone left me hanging. Something happened. And he loses his will to live. To live. He given into this lie that life no longer has any meaning. This would actually be the Mayo Clinic's basic definition of clinical depression. Loss of will to live. I'm talking about Elijah tonight because I want you to see the kind of person that can go through depression. He's like one of the best prophets that we've ever seen. But I'm also showing you Elijah to show you that how he gets out of that depression. This is not the end of the story, hallelujah. This is not the end of the, your story, hallelujah. 
If you wrestle with this, this isn't the end for you. And that's the thing about depression is it tries to tell you that there's no hope and that this is it and this is the end and you're done and there's no hope for you. But this is not the end of the story. The story keeps going if you don't tap out. Instead, tap in. Amen? Depression doesn't make you a bad Christian. So many things can cause depression from trauma, disappointment, life pressures, hormone imbalances, or even satanic spiritual attack. All of these things are coming at you trying to stop you and trying to keep you from going where God wants you to go. Wants to keep you under a broom tree so that you can't go and do the things on Mount Carmel. Do you know what I'm saying? He, the devil wants to keep you hiding in a little room so that you don't go and do what God's called you to do. The good news is that there is no situation so dark that God can't light it up with his hope. Let's look at how God helps Elijah and what Elijah does in response. This is where I would take some notes tonight, so if you have to go back to it. Number one, God ministers to his natural state. This is really interesting to me. We are a braided being. We are spiritual. We are emotional. We are social. We are intellectual, and we are physical. We are a braided being, and you take one, and it affects the others. It's like a rope. You know, you take out one strand, and the rope is weaker. That's why there is a thing called, uh, what's it, uh, uh, sports psychology. Some of you guys, that major, that uh, one of the biggest things is people put their whole identity on being an athlete. They blow out their knee, and now they're like, now what am I? Because my whole identity was based on my physical side, and it can lead into your emotional side. And that could even mess with your social side. And it could even mess with your, your test and anxiety and intellectual side. You see, we are a braided being, and God doesn't just care about your spirit. It's like, well, I'll go to Tupac, get my spirit taken care of. I'll go to my girlfriend and get my, my social taken care of, and, uh, you know, on down the road. God cares not just about your spiritual side. He cares about you, and you are a whole thing, a whole being. And so what's really interesting is God cares about the things that you care about. He designed you to function in a certain way. And if you go to a doctor and you're showing symptoms of depression, they're going to ask you these questions. Are are you getting any exercise? Getting any rest? How's your diet? Guys, you need more than four hours of sleep. Over time, if you only get four hours of sleep a night, you're going to start getting crazy. When I was a, uh, I believe I was a sophomore. No, yes, I was a sophomore. And I was taking 19 hours. And I remember everywhere I was going, I was failing. And I remember I was, tr- I was in the elevator of Jones Hall, and I was trying to get my wallet out. I couldn't get my wallet out, and I started screaming. I started banging the walls. I know, sounds kind of crazy. I thought I was demon-possessed. The thing is, I wasn't getting enough sleep. Really, imp- really, really simple, really simple. All you need is a snack and a nap, right? All you need is just go down, get a snack and a nap. Wake up and be fine, okay, pumpkin? Yeah? Sometimes, uh, sometimes Macy will be like, you know, and... We- you know, we're talking through something, you know, and sometimes she's like, just uncontrollable. It's like, and Kara's like, go to bed, go to bed. You just need a snack and a nap. Go to bed. Snack and a nap. God cares about it, right? This is what he does. Let's go to verse five. Then Elijah laid down under a bush and he fell asleep. Someone say asleep. asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. This is a little while later. So he wakes up. What the heck? Looks around, and there's some cornbread by his head and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he got back to work. No, he laid back down again. Interesting. The angel of the Lord comes back a second time later and touches him and says, get up and eat for your journey. This journey is too much without it. So he got up, and he ate and he drinks. What's interesting is this angel brings him this cornbread and water twice. And he sleeps for a long time in between. And he restores his physical strength before God ever does anything to him emotionally or mentally or anything. He starts with his physical being. This is kind of an interesting thing that God does in his nurture of us. This is the simplest step that you can take. And sometimes that's all we need. And then we're back to normal. Oh, man, I feel better. I don't know what that was all about. Anybody ever get there? Man, I just needed a nap. I was turning into Betty... Whatever, and I needed a Snickers. That's all I needed. (laughs) Betty White, I think is what? Just needed a Snickers bar. Number two, this is what God does. Next, he reconnects with God. So after he's had time to kind of sleep and stuff like that, there have been times when God's like, Mikey, don't even get up today. Just just go to sleep for a while. Don't worry. This sounds weird, but 
there's times whenever this gets in you, right? And he's like, just take a nap through your quiet time this time. Don't use that as an excuse to never have a quiet time. <laughs> I'm, I'm resting in the Lord. <laughs> no, you're not. You're being lazy and you're putting them on the back burner. Now, that's, that's your, your natural normal is, you know, your normal neutral is that you're, you know, spending time with God and you're having enough rest. But whenever you are in this crazy place, sometimes God will say, okay, let's take you out of the game. Let's hit pause for a second, snack and nap. All right, now, number two, he reconnects with God because his connection got frayed, right? Thoughts and feelings that were not from God, which were actually from Satan, took over his inner man in his thought life. Remember that the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind, right? Your heart, your, your emotional self, your mind, your intellectual self. He, whenever something like crazy happens, sometimes whatever happened, his connection was frayed and the thoughts and feelings that were not of God took over his inner man and he lost connection. Things like, man, I'm so alone. I'm the only prophet there is. I'm the only one standing up for God in my whole class. I'm the only one who cares about this. I'm the only one who reaches out and does these things. I'm, the, I'm all by myself. I feel so alone. I'm in the middle of a room and I feel all by myself. These are little seeds that are being planted by the enemy inside your mind trying to get you to where you will feel like you're alone. And if you believe that, if you embrace that, then that's what's going to grow. That seed is what's going to grow. I was just talking to somebody today didn't know this, a couple years ago, uh, there was somebody that was deep in, in our team, even on the lead team, and they didn't come to Two Posts one night. Everybody misses every now and then. And, and, then uh, and then they just dropped the team a couple of months later because no one ever asked them why they were gone. It's like, whoa, what lie did you embrace? What is that all about? Some seed, I'm alone, no one cares, got planted, and you let it grow. When you lose your connection with God, whenever the... Signal is interrupted, and your connection is frayed. These thoughts take over. I'm alone. God didn't come through for me. I'm disappointed. I, my appointment was missed by God. I must be a loser. I must not be a good enough prophet. I must not be a good enough athlete. I must not be a good enough theater student. I must not be a good enough Christian. I must not be enough. Verse 9, then he went into a cave. That's kind of what depression is, right? This dark cave or this dark cloud over your head. And he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, and he whispers, what are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, man of God, what are you doing here? Why are you here? He replies, I've been zealous for you, God. The Israelites, though, they have rejected your covenant. They have torn down your altars. They put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Aren't you going to do anything, God? At least now he's not seething by himself. He actually starts talking to God. So he's reestablishing this connection, even if it's poison, you know, spewing out his vomit on him. But before God answers him, God's like, hmm, that's an interesting story. Um, he has to show him something first. He's like, that's really interesting. Let's put a pin in that. Hey, come here. So the Lord said, <laughs> go out and stand on the mountain. God, I just told you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, let's put a pin in that. Come on, let's go on out. Come on, come on, pumpkin. And they, they come out, and they stand out on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And, and, and God says this, the Lord is about to pass by. So he's looking for him. Okay, God's going to, okay, God's finally showing up. A little late, but he's showing up. So he's looking. Where's God? Where's God? And a great powerful wind tore the mountain. Can you imagine seeing a mountain being torn apart? He's like, whoa, that's crazy. And it shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in that. Well, that's odd. After the wind, there was this earthquake. I mean, could you imagine seeing that? You'd be freaking out. The sound. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was this huge roaring fire, like California style, you know? It's a big fire. It lasted for months. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire was a still, small voice. A whisper, a gentle whisper. See, God is here. You might just be looking in the wrong place. We are going somewhere. We are going somewhere tonight. Okay, you have to know that God is here. You just might be looking 
in the wrong place. God, I thought you would be in the wind. God, I thought you would be in the fire. God, I thought you would be in the earthquake. God, I thought you were going to heal me. God, I thought you were going to speak a prophecy over me. I thought that this thing that you had me doing for all these years was going to turn into something, but it seems like it's nothing. I thought you were going to fix it all. I thought you were going to turn her heart back to me. I thought you were going to fix my parents' divorce. I thought you were going to do what I wanted you to do, O oh, genie. He finds where God actually is in this whisper, in the place you don't expect. What's so funny is God was expecting God in this other way. Jezebel's going to get kicked out. Ahab's going to be a good king. Everybody's going to be a revival. Everyone's going to love him. He's going to be a great famous prophet. But the wind and the earthquake and the fire didn't, that's not where God was. And now he finds a gentle whisper in a place he wasn't expecting it. When he... He finds where God actually is in this whisper. It's in this unexpected place. And there he begins this painful reconnection. Hey, Sean, is that camera going out again? Is that one going out? Can you bring that to me? Which one? Which one? Is that one? Is that the one that went out? Okay, bring it to me. See, sometimes here's the weird thing. Okay, so this is for our online audience. And what's interesting about these cameras is they have a... Um, they have an HDMI port thingy. Now, this is you, right? Okay? But here's the deal. Sometimes there's all this flesh in between the source and the camera, and so it kind of blocks the signal, and so we don't really have a, a signal right now. So what you got to do is sometimes you got to move from where you're at, and you got to go to a different place, and you got to reestablish the connection. And so you got to get closer to the source where the source is. And are we back on? Are we on? Hi. Hi, online people. It's good to see you. All right, we got our source back. Everybody give it, back. Give it up for uh, Lizzie for running this camera here. What's so crazy is sometimes we don't even realize we have drifted. We don't even realize what's come between us and our source, right? Sometimes it's normal things. Sometimes it's things you have to get done. Sometimes it's your you know, people in your life or whatever, but we crowd God out and all of a sudden we don't have room for him. Or sometimes maybe it's a thought that got planted in your heart and you got bitter about something, you got offended about something and you got cut off from your friend and all of a sudden you also feel cut off from God. That's strange. That actually happens, by the way. You lose your connection with God. God, I'm disappointed. And maybe you don't want to say that, so you gloss it over with some kind of plastic mask and you try to act like you're not disappointed. But deep down, if you were to peel back the veneer you would find in your heart, you're really disappointed, and it's because you believed something that was a lie. And you got to go back, and you got to reestablish your connection with God. You need this connection if you're going to come out of the pit. Worship. We're singing words about God, right? Reminding us, oh, yeah, there is no mountain you won't climb up. There is no wall you won't kick down. There's no shadow. That you won't light up when you come after me. I thought you disappointed me and left me, but there's really, you're leaving the 99 for the one, and you remind yourself you're reestablishing the uplink. The connection is coming back. You open your Bible, and you're like, oh, yeah, God's not against me. He's for me. Whoa, I know that already, but why did I lose that connection in moments when we're waiting on the whisper of God? In those moments, and he just lays on this cool little epiphany you never thought about. And you're like, oh, and you start writing it down. The connection is reestablished. That's where hope is renewed. And it doesn't matter what you're going through, this peace that passes understanding. It's like that little light shining into the rat, his bucket, and it gives you the strength to fight again. Precisely the time when you don't want to come to... The precisely the moment you don't want to come to two posts, the precisely the moment when you don't want to go to worship is the moment you've got to go because that's you reestablishing your connection. So you're going to want to be like, oh, I'm dealing with this heavy stuff. I just need to go home and cry and just be alone and just get more darkness around me and more dark thoughts. Instead, you've got to go and reestablish your connection, move out of where you are and go back to the back and connect with that thing so you can go back out. And get your hope back. It's where hope is renewed. There you reconnect with the vision of who he is. And the enemy is trying to slip in these DMs of unbelief into your mind. Oh, God, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want you to be like him, Eve. He, wants you, he doesn't want you to be like God. 
God is taking from you. He's hiding from you. He doesn't want you to succeed. He wants to take that girlfriend from you. He wants to take your boyfriend from you. He wants to do all these bad things. He wants to keep you from fun. You know what? Don't listen to Mikey. Don't listen to him. He's just going to tell you all these things that God doesn't want for you. You need to go out and be free and be yourself. And what's funny is that freedom seems more like chains after a while. Yeah. Freedom seems more like handcuffs. And all of a sudden, you find yourself not yourself and you've got to get a little liquid courage just to be yourself again and to be light and then to be fun again and then for long you don't dance like you used to because all those sins tie you up so you've got to get back and reestablish your connection with the living God. Coming here tonight was one of the best things that you could have done if you're wrestling with depression. I don't like big crowds of people. It's the best thing you can do if you're in depression. Because God is moving through the worship. God is speaking now through this sermon. And he is speaking through the people with those green glow sticks all around the room. And as you listen to the words of the worship songs, you're reminded who he is and what he wants to do in your life and who he says you are. Reestablish your connection. Someone say reestablish. Re and the third thing is he's got to leave the realm of the isn'ts and live in the realm of the is's. That is grammatically correct, by the way. See, God wasn't in the whisper or, or the wind and the earthquake and the fire, but he was, he is in the whisper. There were so many bad things happening, but God is still on the throne. And we live our faith. I said this last week, like, like there's no God on the throne. Verse 13, then a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He repeats the same phrase. Where are you? Let me ask you that question tonight. Where are you? Where are you with God? Sometimes I sit down with just students with coffee or whatever. I'm like, where are you? <gasps> oh, my God, he sees me. He sees into my soul. No, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just asking. Where are you? Because that's important to me. I want you to be where God wants you to be. He replied, I've been zealous for you, O God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They have torn down your altars. and put your prophets of death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Kind of the same Thing. Man, you've really been, you know, oscillating around that thing, huh? Um, God says, okay, I need you to stop right there. And he, he corrects his thinking, takes that seed that was planted. He's been really just mulling over this because he says it almost, he says it verbatim. It's like, man, he's really been thinking about this. This is deep, entrenched thinking. And God takes it and he digs up that seed and uproots it. And he says, I got to stop you right there. There are 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and those whose mouths have not kissed him. There's people, you don't know what I'm doing other places. You have no idea how I'm working in other ministries. You have no idea what I'm doing in other people of God. You have no idea what, you, what I'm doing in your own congregation, through your own students, because they're not telling you because they're trying to not let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. They're not doing it for show. There's all kinds of things happening you don't even know about, Elijah. You just need to trust me. If you want God to deliver you out of depression, you're going to have to leave the realm of the isn'ts for the realm of the is's. There's so many things that aren't right. When depression comes in, our minds tend, mind does, tends to gravitate towards all that isn't going right. And we just focus on the isn'ts. We dwell on all that isn't good. Mom and dad are about to get a divorce. The chemistry test, I failed. Oh, my gosh. I asked her out on a date, and she acted a little weird. She gave me some weird nonverbals. I don't know what that means. What am I supposed to do with that? What if it doesn't work? What if I never get married? What if I'm alone the rest of my life? What if I live as a hermit like old Ben Kenobi? What am I going to do? It's like, whoa, buddy, you've really entrenched that, haven't you? You're really, you know you're 18. You know, like, you're probably going to get married. It's going to be okay. Life is full of isn'ts. Someone say it. Life is full of isn'ts. But we have to focus. We, we, we can focus on that all day. And I know that people are like, oh, the power of positive thinking. I'm like, yeah, I mean, there is actually some truth in that. Because if you want to spend all your time develop, you know, just in the cloud, just thinking about all the things going wrong, then that's where your mind's going to go. In skiing, wherever your eyes go, that's where your skis go. So if I'm, I'm focused on all the negative, my skis are going right into the trees. If I start looking at the path, that's where my skis go. So the past, we've got to focus on that. Or we're going to stay in depression. 
We have to turn our thoughts. This is what we call taking our thoughts captive. We talked about last week. We got to focus on the is is. Jesus is still Lord. He still reigns by faith. You are a son. You are a daughter by faith. You still have the inheritance as a child of God. That is. That's something that is. He has given you his Holy Spirit that indwells you, that's still inside of you, that guides you and shows you the way. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And when you feel alone, you just got to stand on that word. He's not going to leave me nor forsake me, God. I'm going to say it out loud. I'm going to tell you, Lord God, that I agree with you. You do not leave me. You do not forsake me. You either believe that or you have unbelief. If you say, I'm alone, then that means you don't believe that God is with you. Focus on the is. God is with you, even if no one else is. And the other people, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed, bowed to Baal. There is is. He will never leave you nor forsake you. His plan, he has a purpose for your life. He still works all things for the good of those who love you and who are called according to Jesus Christ. It's not a pain-free future, but it's a consequential future. All Elijah can see is the bad stuff, but God says, by the way, I'm still God. By the way, I made all of this. By the way, this is really not a big deal to me. I mean, it's a big deal, but it's not, this isn't like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because I made all of this. I've got this. And the fourth thing he does is he acts upon what God has told him to do whether you want to or not. Okay, so God created you with a responsibility in God's kingdom. He didn't just say, okay, cool, you're just here to just sit now. No, it's like, oh, I got these cool things for you to do and go and create, and that's why you got a major, and that's why something is driving you to go and do something with your life because, yes, more important than what you do is who you are. You're a human being before you're a human doing, but in the same sense, the other leg that you stand on is that you are made to do good things. You were, you were created with answers for your generation. We talked about our worship on the lawn. You are created to do something of consequence in the kingdom of God. Amen? God created you for good works. This is what it says in verse 15. He says, go back the way you came. Go. That's a verb, right? To the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, I want you to anoint Hazel, and I want you to anoint Nimshi, and I want you to anoint Elijah. He basically gave him this, this thing of something to do. A reason to get out of the bed in the morning. Go back the way you came. Don't tap out in life. Don't live as a hermit. Tap in. Instead of stepping out and stepping away and secluding and getting into isolation and turning away from your friends and your godly body of Christ, tap in instead. Go back in and start doing what you were created to do, whether you feel like it or not. God, I just don't feel like it right now. We'll do it anyway. And when you'll start out by, doing not, by not feeling like it. Before long, you'll start feeling like it. God gives him something to do, a reason to get out of bed. Listen, uh, Carrie, come on up. Generation Z, where's my Gen Z's? Gen Z's, where you at? Raise your hand around in the air like you just don't care. Generation Z, millennials, where are the millennials? I am the first of you, by the way. I'm a millennial. I am the first of you. First year. Woo. Okay, check this out. But near the end of the millennials and the beginning of the Gen Z's, this isn't true of everybody, but the stats say this about about your generation, that if you don't feel like doing something, you don't do it. There's a thing called ghosting. Maybe you've heard of it. Someone texts you and you're not polite enough to say, I'm not interested. You just, I'm just going to pretend like I didn't even see that. Wow. Wow. Gen Z, you cutthroat, man. You are cutthroat. At least give the boy an answer. Anyway, that's another sermon. Relationship series later. As a general rule, hear me now. This is where it gets into spiritual things. As a general rule, if you, like, really don't want to do something, you feel like that's God telling you that maybe God's not wanting you to do that. But this is some dangerous theology. Because one day you're going to be married, and you're going to have a, a wife and, a, and three kids and a dog and a cat. And all these responsibilities are going to be upon you, and you're not going to feel like it one day. You might turn 40-something and go you know, buy a convertible and just drive off into the sunset because you don't feel like it. Right? And 
after all, God wants me to be happy, right? Whoa, bad theology. Bad theology. God wants you to do what's right. That will lead to joy, but it won't always lead to present happiness. I mean, when you're working out and you're so sore, does that make you happy? Not really. Right? Sometimes you got to do something you don't want to do. <clears throat> if you want to get out of depression, a big practical thing is just to do what you're supposed to do. You know, after, you, after you've done the other three things, go to bed at 11. Get up at 7. Go to class. Take a shower. Get a calendar. Put reminders on your phone. I had so much pressure on me because people were mad at me because I kept missing appointments that I finally found this amazing thing called an iPhone, and it has a calendar on it. What? Check this out. In there, yeah, for real, in there, there's a calendar. You can set alarms and stuff like that. And so I stopped missing meetings. It's just hashtag adulting stuff. But what it does, what it does is you just start getting in a rhythm of doing what you know you need to do. In fact, one of my great, great authors, John Maxwell, says, do two things you don't want to do every single day just so you start, you know, you stay in the habit of it. Otherwise, you're going to start trying to avoid things, and you're going to be like, I really just don't feel like doing that. That must be God telling me I'm not supposed to do that. Whoa, do not base your theology on feelings. That is the worst thing you can do. We'll talk more about how to hear the voice of God later. Get a calendar, set reminders, manage your time, come to two posts and worship and read your Bible and do all these things. I'm going to end with Zechariah 9. As for you, because the blood of my covenant, this is Jesus speaking to the people who had had everything stripped away from them years after the kings that Elijah was talking about. God, before the blood of his covenant has even been spilled, Jesus says this, as for you, because the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Doesn't depression feel like a waterless pit? I'm just going to dry up and die in here. But because the blood of God's covenant is with us, he will free us. And check this out. We feel like prisoners of depression, like it's unbreakable, unbeatable. Verse 12, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now, announce that I will restore twice as much to you. If we are anything, we are prisoners of hope. We are not prisoners of depression. We're prisoners of hope. I am so chained to hope. I'm so chained to that. That when I'm chained to hope, I can't be chained to depression. 